So that's just me. Um, a civil engineer from UCC, Master of Engineering, chartered in 86, ice trucking in 94, consulting engineers for about thir just over 13 years with Paul Tumi and Arab, joined the fire department uh, in 95, um, have been in county and city since then. Um, for a good number of years, I've been a visiting lecturer in CIT and a research supervisor. I'm a number of committees in the CIO over the years in the department. And then just finishing up a four year stint as the Irish representative on a European action, cooperation of science and technology in fire and timber, which anybody who's ever interested in getting involved with in these cost committees are fantastic. You meet the top people in, in Europe and, and in the world in these areas, which, which is fantastic. So just that's just me, okay? No. So what I want to talk to tonight is we, we've only an hour, everybody obviously you know we don't want to go on all night. So I'm kind of trying to cover a fair bit. Uh, reasonably quickly, some people will find some parts of it maybe a bit too simple, some may have heard it before, but hopefully everybody will get something out of it. So I just, just bounce off the summary fire safety legislation, really just, you know, just a quick few <coughs> slides. I'll have a look at some common problems on site, which are things that, um, you know, that we regularly see. They're quite simple in their own right, but just to put them up there. Then we'll have a look at fire safety design, some of the kind of core elements of it, and then we'll have a little bit of innovative fire safety design particularly timber construction from a sustainability element that there's a, there's a huge drive nationally and internationally to try and have more sustainability materials. And it, it can work very well for fire if it's done correctly. A lot of modern research is, is very interesting, which we'll be finish off with. So that's roughly what I'm going to be talking about. Everybody can hear me okay? All right, so ju just as a kind of a starting point, um, the basics of fire, so here we've got our fire triangle, everybody's used to fuel, oxygen, and heat. Now there is a, a fourth corner, let's say, which is the chemical reaction. And you know yourself, you throw too much into the fire, the fire roars. So every 10 degrees different rise in temperature, the reaction rate doubles. So there's a huge change in temperature. That's why the earlier you can get to a fire and hit it, you're going to have a much bigger impact on it from a firefighting point of view. So that's the, the bottom piece there, and the top piece then is the danger. And the biggest danger of fire is probably carbon monoxide. Because at, if there's 1.3% if there's of carbon monoxide in a room that you walk into, you're immediately unconscious, and depending on your body weight, you're dead within two, and th two to three minutes. So that's the real killer, carbon monoxide. That's why carbon monoxide alarms are just so important, and that's why they've been brought into the, to the building regulations recently in Title Guidance Document J. Okay, so just a, a couple of basics there. So just to touch off the legislation, just, just a couple of minutes on it. Now, first, the core legislation, we've got a Fire Services Act that we use to um, put out fires, we use to serve closure notices, fire safety notices, and so on, and give advice under. That will be used for all buildings that don't come under building control regulations, and in certain times as well for those buildings as well. Then there's the Building Control Act, and under the Building Control Act, you have two regulations, building control regulations and building regulations. Under the building regulations, there's a series of technical guidance documents that most of you will be aware of, and one part of that would be technical guidance document B. But that's prescriptive regulations. So it's 45 meters to the exit or whatever, end of story, you comply or you don't comply. Now, under that God document, if you comply with technical guidance documents, you're then prima facie complying with the regulations. Now, rather than writing a huge big document, taking guidance document B, the department and their wisdom, as many of you probably know, linked that document back to other UK documents so that rather than stop the book getting too thick. One of the problems with that is that it's a 2006 document at the moment for commercial buildings and it's still linking to the existing documents in the UK. Now, 5588 in the UK, that's been superseded for a number of years. It's been replaced by a different document, double but we're still linking to that. So that's officially the prim facie link. Building bulletin seven for schools, now replaced building bulletin 100. HTM 81, now HTM 502 for, for, for hospitals. They're prim facie links. So that's the prescriptive piece. The next place you can go then is double nine, double nine. Now that's not a prim facie link. That's a semi fire engineering code. You're halfway between prescriptive and fire engineering. We'll talk a little bit about, about that in a minute. And then you jump on to fire engineering design, full fire engineering design. 
You can do a lot of hair, simple hair calculations for furniture and design, very, very good stuff, um, which we'll talk about a bit in a minute. And primarily, that's the PD7974 documents, a suite of furniture engineering documents that are out there at the moment, very good documents, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Just on, on the right there, there's a number of testing standards. If fire doors were tested, if wall elements were tested, um, up to a number of years ago, they'd have been done to BS476. The majority of new buildings, certainly anything that's linked to the Euro codes, must now be tested to ISEMs. So there's 1363 to 1366, so it's load correct elements generally, non-load bearing, load bearing, and systems. <coughs> so they're the new, the new documents. That's a, just a picture of our, our, the kiln, one of the kilns we have in CIT. Um, we have 180 kilns uh, kiln, up to 1,400 feet centre. We do full fire curves, computer programmed, and we can put under tension, compression, bending, or whatever. Uh, and that's just a, a test we're doing there on, a, on an old joist, a new joist with, a, with, a, with a epoxy <coughs> and a reinforced um, a core. Just out of interest, okay? Now, so just touching the legislation, as I say, I've only so long to talk, so, so I'm kind of just punching little bits out there. So under the First Services Act, people might hear a fire officer talking about 18.2. So it should be the duty of every person having control over premises to take all reasonable measures to guard against the outbreak of fire, and secondly, to ensure the safety of people in the building in the event of fire. So that's the kind of core little piece of legislation. You may hear of a potentially dangerous building, which you may serve a fire safety notice on, and there's only certain reasons we can serve that. So if the building would, now I've, I've reduced this down, okay, it, it's much longer in reality. So if it would constitute a serious danger to life for any of the following reasons, too many people in the building, absence of proper appliances or fittings, flammable materials, inadequate means of escape or egress, inadequate fire safety notices, the fire might spread rapidly through the building. There may be defective power supply or lighting, defective heating, or any similar reason. So they're the kind of core reasons. Now, when we can serve a fire safety notice, we can prohibit the use of the building in total or part of the building, or we can prohibit the use of the building, which is more likely, until certain things have been done and they have to be specified. Okay? Now, the kind of fire safety certificates that are out there, which a lot of you I'm sure are familiar with, you've got your standard fire safety certificate for a building, then you've a revised fire safety certificate. Now, if you have a building and you haven't built it yet, you can go for a revised fire safety certificate for some changes. Now, if the design is very similar to the initial design, you can get 75% of the fee back. So you pay the full fee again, and you get 75% back. Just out of interest, Rarely used, but it's in there. The seven day notice we'll touch on in, in, in a moment. If that's where you want to start very quickly, and you come in with a fire cert and a seven day notice together instead of a committee notice. Then there's a regularization certificate, and that's where you built the building without a fire cert and you want to regularize the situation. In relation to fees, a fire cert and a revised fire cert is your 290 square meter. Seven day notice is double that cost. And a regularization cert is four times that cost, just to put it in context. Then, just in the same legislation, a disability access cert or a DAC, and a revised one would be quite similar. They'd be 800 euros and 500 if it comes in with the fire cert. Okay? All right, so this is a tiny bit small, but I thought it was worth just having a glance at, see if people can see it. Um, on this seven day notice, when you send in a seven day notice, you sign a statutory declaration. Now what you say is that, subject to Article 12, we solemnly, or I only solemnly declare that the application has been completed in full and complies with the building control regulations. So what you're actually signing there is you're saying that Article 12 points to Article 20, which effectively says that you're sending a valid first safety certificate application. That means that we can't really look for further information, or shouldn't be, because you're declaring statutory that this application is, is perfect. Okay? Now, you further declare that if you've started any works before this, that's going to fully comply. And also, if we weren't works done, you must do it within whatever period we, we require. Now, if you have already done works without a fire cert, that would probably need a regularization cert. And we'd normally look for two separate certificates, a seven-day notice 
and a regularization as two separate drawings and reports. Is that of interest? Okay. And then just at the, at the bottom, it has to be witnessed, as, as you, a lot of you probably know. And then it, there's just a warning on it to the fence to knowingly and recklessly make a, a statutory declaration is, quite a, is looked on quite importantly or seriously from a judge's point of view. Okay. So that's, that's how I'm doing legislation, just a touching off it, okay, because we're running so much time. Okay, so some common on site fire safety problems. So this is the first one. It might be a little bit hard to see. I should walk, I should walk away from the camera. You can see the position of the, um, of, of the, of the fixings. Now, uh, in the, on the left hand, maybe it's the arrow, the left hand up here, um, that's ceiling fixings. Now, ceiling fixings are 230 centers for screws, 150 for nails, and depending on the type of staple you're used, they're, they're probably closer again. So you're watching for that center. Um, when you're talking about wall panels, it's 300 millimeter spacing. And at the external angle, where they join together to be 200 millimeter centers. Now, if you put the wrong center up for paneling, Jiprock, Lafarge, Firmacell, whoever you're using, all bets are off. It's not a 30 minute wall anymore. It's not a 60 minute wall or whatever you're using. It's very important to keep an eye on it, okay? Um, things as well, that, that up, that this one up here on the, on the right hand top corner here, where you have a gap. You might think that's fairly okay. But, but like, if you see that in a fire test, let's say in Watford, we've been over to the RE Centre in Watford, it's the, it's the joints where everything fails on panels. The joint fails in a panel where you have it without a fully butt jointed. The heat gets in there much more rapidly. It gets around it. And it breaks the board down much faster. The board turns to the board. The board chemically turns to dust effectively, much more quickly. Okay. And down the bottom, obviously, where you've gaps as well, because what happens in a gap is in the in the furnace, let's say, the temperature will go up to let's say eight or nine hundred degrees centigrade. Now timber will burn at about three hundred degrees centigrade. So you've got eight hundred degree gas shoot through those gaps, and it's it's burning much more rapidly at the timbers. Okay. So it's important to be constructed. <laughs> Correctly and carefully. Okay, so that's kind of just class word fixings and joints. Poor compartmentation. Again, I should have bought a point with this one, but you can see along here that amount of insulation isn't correct. At a compartment wall, you must take the block work up to within 50 millimeters of the battens or the or the breathable felt, whatever, and then just a small bit of rock wood along the top. You can't pack full of rock wood like that, that's not compliant. Okay. Also, some of you see in attics, they don't bring the slab fully up to the top. And things like at, at the, on the left hand bottom where the tape is sit under the partition, where you've used that, that, that the gases can shoot through the gap at very high temperatures, they're going to burn, and that timber is going to burn now very quickly. Oh, very, very, bottom one. Excellent. Thanks, John. Oh, yeah, very good. So, as you can see the, the bottom here, those kind of gaps, also the top of the doors. You might say, look, should no fire can get through the top of the door, that's not a problem. But effectively, the hot gas shooting through there would be burning the upper side of that timber as well as the face inside very quickly, right the way through, and it'll widen the gap as it goes through. And it could actually, if you 800 degree gas went through that gap, it could set fire to curtains on the other side or something <coughs> on the other side. So all of a sudden, then you've, 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 you've gone right through your compartment line. So these details are important when you're snagging. Penetrations, as so well, two types of penetration. You see these ones that we regularly see as you go on site. And to be fair to yourselves and electricians and plumbers, they're very slow to block all these up because next week somebody wants another pipe or they might get it quite finished. Do you know what I mean? So it's not perfect, but, but that kind of thing in the compartment line, and you know, the fire is going to break right through. Not to mind the damage from hot toxic gas. And you saw when I talked about the 1.3% carbon monoxide, it'll break through the whole building very rapidly. The other area to watch is where steel beams penetrate compartment lines. Like you might have cavity walls in a, a semi-detached house or in an apartment block. If the steel runs through, as you know, heat conducts through steel very easily. Also, this kind of thing here, where you've let's say a 215 block wall, you rest your beam from one side on it, rest your beam from the other side on it. Straight away now you have a heat conduction right through into the into the neighboring building. Bad detailing, okay? Very bad detailing. And it's something to, that could be missed quite easily. Okay? And um, so that's just a, on penetrations. 
Now, on rescue windows, um, they should never be top hung. If a firefighter wants to, to get somebody out of the building, you can see this firefighter here with the station officer looking out the other window. He can't possibly get in that top hung window. Okay, so that, that's not the way to do, to do a rescue window. Also, I'm sure many of you are aware of it, but that kind of a hinge, you're not going to get the width there probably that you need for an escape window. So that would need to be changed to have a hinge at the, at the side to get your full opening. Now, if it's a big enough window that you get your opening, that's fine. But if you don't get your 450 millimeters there and your 0.33 square meters in total, it's not going to be compliant. So watch that one. As well, if you're putting in a, a VLUX, a rescue VLUX, so that may, I don't think that probably is a rescue VLUX, but look just for, you can't be more than 1.7 meters from the eaves, so that you can, you can come out the rescue window here, you can hold on there with your hands, and hopefully leave yourself down to get your toes into the gutter and be rescued by a ladder. If you're five meters down there, how do you get down without a roof ladder to the rescue? Also, the area under here must be free of of ponds and railings so that you can put a ladder up there. The, and, no, the other thing we came across then was instead of having a, one of these multi joining little clips on rescue windows at the bottom, this was put at the top that nobody could reach. So just small things about windows. Okay, so that's just a couple of small <coughs> basics that we come across regularly. Now, just a couple of core elements of fire safety design. So, as I said at the beginning, Prescriptive is a starting point, BS7, sorry, take that start with B2006 for commercial buildings, 2017 for dwellings, or dwelling houses, and their link codes. That's probably 90%, 95% of the first as we do are to TGDB and its related codes, as, as a lot of you know. Now, move from that then to semi prescriptive. Now, I'll go through these in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, Say prescriptive is a BS999 suite, and we'll talk about that in a second. That's half of between fire engineering and prescriptive. It's in the middle. And then the last one here is 7974, which is fire engineering design. A lot of it can be done by hand. Now, what's quite interesting is there's a lot of programs out there that will spit out a lot of numbers, but these are hugely variable. Depending within the number, like, there's a slide, I didn't put up tonight now, but there is a slide that shows that if an element is burning, it's reflecting a certain amount of heat, it's uh, convecting a certain amount of heat, it's absorbing a certain amount of heat, depending on MS 11s and all these kind of numbers. So if the wrong number is put in to the, to the surrounding, let's say, if the wrong number of openings are put in, like, like if a fire was developed in this room, the temperature the fire will get at, we get to, is all based on the amount of opening, the height and width of the opening to the room, and its ratio to the surface area of the room. So any room can be checked, and if you change your openings in a room, you can change the fire configuration. So by putting the right numbers in here, you can make it work for you. So somebody, some fire expert might give you a computer program and say, look, this works perfectly. And it, it all depends on what boundary conditions have been put in. Whereas when you use the hand calculations in this suite, at least you know what you're doing and you know what's going in there and it's simpler and it's conservative and to be honest I'd almost be happier to see hand calculations here done than some of the computer analysis. Okay, now if you have somebody who knows what they're doing, very very useful but you need to make sure somebody knows what they're doing and they can back it up with this. Okay, so, so looking at the prescriptive for a second, um, Tango and Stunt B2006 as most of you probably know has five key parts, means of escape, B1, linings, compartmentation, space separation from adjoining buildings, and fire service intervention, water supplies, um, place for the fire brigade to come up, and so on. So that's this document here, 2006. It's an almost 30 year old document at this stage. There's no sign of the new one coming out quite as yet, even though it's in preparation. Um, this was brought out for dwelling houses in 2017, and that's kind of a B6, B7, B8, B9, B10 on the same headings. So that's kind of prescriptive, and that points us to other documents, as I said earlier. So we won't do any more in prescriptive, you can pick up the book yourselves, okay? So what we will have a look at, we'll have a look at 9999. Okay. The way 9999 works is the first thing you pick is you pick 
What kind of occupancy have you got? Have you got somebody in office, like this chap in the Oval Office up here? He'd be occupancy A. So he's awake and familiar with the building. He might rather be at home, but he's awake and familiar with the building. So that's an office or industrial premises. That would be a type A. B would be awake and unfamiliar with the building. Let's say shops or where we are at the moment even. C then is sleeping. So sleeping is broken into three subcategories. You've got individual flats, unmanaged, service flats or boarding schools, and the last one is hotels. So the bulk of this hotel would be a C3. If they wish, they could break the conference rooms into separate areas, maybe move them up a level, potentially, but generally be ordered as a C3. <coughs> Hospitals is, is D, and occupants in transit are E. So double nine, double nine doesn't deal with D and E, it just really deals with A, B, and C. Okay? No. So that's the first thing you do for double nine, double nine. So rather than just, uh, it gives, you're just trying to get now more, a little bit more detail about who's using the building. So first you get a letter, A, B, or C, and then you look at the file growth rate, and you've got a number, one, two, three, and four. So we're starting to hone in now on what's actually going to happen in the fire. Now, these are the fire growth parameters in kilojoules per second cubed, which is really kind of fire acceleration, fire growth rate acceleration. This little graph up here shows you slow growth fire, medium, fast, and ultra fast. Now, if you look here, it's, it's in seconds, okay? So, I can hardly see it now when I'm looking at, but uh, that's five, I think. So that, that's a five megawatt fire across that line, five megawatts. So, what it's saying is for an ultra fast fire, at under 200 seconds, you'll have a five megawatt fire. Now, a five megawatt fire is five armchairs blazing. That's a five megawatt fire, roughly, okay? Now, whereas if you have a slow growth fire, you're over here at, let me see what the six is, uh, six, at, at 10 minutes, the slow is up at one megawatt, medium, it's up at four megawatts, whatever, and fast is, is, is run away in you already. So here's a huge difference depending which one you pick. So it makes a lot of sense to much more tightly decide what fire is in your room, and you get a much better idea of what's actually gonna happen in the room. So you can see here, slow would be a banking hall, uh, stacked cardboard boxes would be medium, bale thermoplasts. You, you need to get into quite complex stuff under fast and ultra fast is flammable liquids. Okay, so just to give you some, these are the kind of uh, rates you can use, and you can use these in all the calculations of, of the PD 7974s. That's what we use to find what's actually going to happen in the room. Okay, now, so you put them together. So under A, occupants are awake. Is there a slow, medium, fast, or fast fire? So you've got an A1, an A2, or an A3 profile. Same for B, B1 to B3, or C1 to C3. So you can zone in very easily. What kind of building have I got? No, 9999 doesn't deal with ultra fast fires. You have to go to full fire safety engineering for ultra fast fires. What it says you can do is, like this lady, you can sprinkle, <coughs> fully sprinkle the building. And you can, when you sprint through a building in double nine, double nine, you drop it one risk profile. So if you sprint through an A4 building, it'll become an A3. If you have an A2 building and sprint it becomes an A1. Because obviously when you're going to immediately sprint through over an area, the fire is going to happen, it's not going to spread as fast, is it? So that, that's reasonable. So that's how double nine, double nine works. Once you decide what kind of building you have, here's some examples. A bar is a B2, a machine print room is an A3, and so on. Just gives you some examples to help you. But you can always go back and actually calculate the fire load quite easily and decide what kind of room have you got. So you've decided on your room. Now, once you know your room in double five, double eight, in, and in Tech Guys document B, the distance is prescriptive. Whereas here now, the distance is going to change. So if I have an A1, Two ways of travel, I can have 65 meters to my exit, to either exit. Whereas if I have a C1, I have 27 meters. Or a C3, I have 14 meters. So there's a huge variation, but it zones in much more accurately on the type of building you have. So it's a good document. Now, 
Double nine, double nine isn't a prime of facie liquid part B. If we get a certain in double nine, double nine, we have to look at it as alternative solutions. We can look at it as prime facile link, even though it has taken over in the UK from double five, double eight. We have a letter from the Department of Housing, as they're now called, a letter from a number of years ago, which says we can use double nine, double nine as an alternative solution only. We still have to make it as good as double five, double eight equivalent. Okay? All right, so that's just uh, that. Now, again, the other, I just pulled a couple of slides in here now just to show you. Ceiling height. So if I have a, a I'm oh, sorry, no book now. If I have a 10 meter high ceiling, I can allow a 30% increase or reduction depending on, on what I need. So my travel distance can increase by 30% from the table I just showed you. <coughs> my door width can reduce by 30%. My car door and stair width can reduce by 30%. Now that's only down to another table which gives you absolute limits. You can't obviously go down to, to a 200 millimeter door, do you know what I mean? But there's another table of your maximum, your backstop, which you can't go past. Okay? So, so quite a good code. I like, I like the code. It's very good. We're, we're dealing with it at the moment for some buildings. It's a, it's a very good code. Okay, so that's just a little touch off double nine, double nine. Now, Having a look then at, at the PD7974, the kind of things that, that are covered, as we've touched at the very end, CIT were a number of courses, they cover these PD7974s, as well as prescriptive stuff. So the kind of stuff it covers is evacuation design from first principles, fire design in the enclosure of origin, what fire load have you got, how do you work out the fire load, this kind of stuff, smoke spread beyond the enclosure of origin, structural response and spread of fire beyond the enclosure of origin, Fire safety systems response times and reliability, and fire service intervention times. Now, on the fire service intervention, you can't rely on the fire service arriving, so we generally don't design into it. It's there really so that you'd know, you'd realize, look, realistic, by the time people, anybody gets here, even the best situation, the fire could be very advanced. Okay, so, no. So first, the kind of things you might look at is, you might look at the fire load density in the enclosure. So, this little formula, so if I want to know the fire load of this room, what I do is I say, okay, how much carpet is there? How many chairs, lecterns, skirtings? You just get the you just get the calorie value of each one. So the calorie value of timber, of MDF, of whatever you're using in the room. You just multiply by how many kilograms you have on it and divide it by the floor area. That's all you do. And you can get the fire load of the room. So you get if you've got 100 kilograms of MDF and 50 kilograms of, of, of carpeting, whatever you have, add them all together, you get a full fire load, divide it by the area of the room, and that gives you a fire load. And then you go back to your table, is it a slow, is it a medium, ultra fast or fast, and away you go. And you can then compare your building to another building and say, look, this is actually comparable to, and it helps in design. Okay, that's one. This is some typical fire load densities. A dwelling would be, let's say the average would be 780 megajoules per square meter, and so on down. Now, when you're designing for fire, as you probably know if you're designing for structures, you generally use a 95% fractile. You know, there's only 5% of values would be higher than it. So that if you look at the strength of timber, you use a 95% value. In fire, you can drop it to an 80% value. So that's 80% of the maximum test that's been recorded. Okay? So this is the value you generally take, and that's your that's your fire load densities. So you can work out <coughs> you can work out your fire load densities for any building from these kind of tables. Okay. Now, just out of interest, there are a number of years ago, 2011, when a master student who's here tonight supporting me, um, and myself, let's say we did work in it. He did most of the work now, to be fair. So, now what he did is, he, the white here shows us the lower and highest published values, the rate of the values that he, that he calculated in CIT using its bomb calorimeter. And what he did is he got materials from throughout CIT, all the different rooms, worked out the number of kilograms in every room, and the rooms he looked at, and he, he got a fire load density, and he used the bomb calorimeter which we have in CIT, and basically, um, it's very detailed, calibrated very sensitively, and he, he was able to get the various calorie values. And that's the, the values. 
Again, this is the maximum that we got from the data, minimum and the value that we got in CRT. So just to, to, to quite useful. Now some other things that PD, I just pulled little tiny pieces out. You can also count the height of, of, of fear above an opening. So quite often you look at the opening and you look at the amount of heat exposed from the opening from a point of space separation. But in reality, once the window goes, you're going to, going to get this kind of flame. So in reality, you're going to have a much more, like quite often you might look at an adjoining building and say, look, to the fires here, try no window at that level, my window's much higher. But in reality, you might have a 15 or 20 meter flame from the other opening. So this allows you to calculate that very easily. You just need your, your burning rate, also called the mass loss rate, because when timber is within a kiln, we weigh at both sides, and we can see how much of it is burning, and that allows us to calculate how much is being lost or being burnt, because it's much easier to do it that way. So you get your burning rate kilograms per second, you just get your width of your opening, height of your opening, and you can get the flame out, simple as that. Very simple. Does it look simple? <laughs> Okay, I've got one convert, okay. So you can look at things like smoke spread beyond the enclosure of origin. Again, you may have curtains dropping down quite often. Like in a shopping center, let's say, it's important when there's a fire in the retail unit, they generally be sprinklered to keep it down from five megawatts to probably one megawatt, that kind of way, uh, depending on the, on the shop. You then would have the smoke coming out and you want to keep it hot, direct it, and get it up into the smoke as far as quickly as you can. And there's little numbers here again to allow you to calculate that. It also gives you an idea of structural response and spread of fire beyond the enclosure of origin. So depending, it says, what would you like to use? Would you like to use, I can have to look here to see it, standard fire curves, ISO 834 curves. Do you want to use experimental curves, actual fire curves, in other words? Do you want to use kind of time equivalent, how much energy is under the curve, which everybody isn't totally happy with, doing it that way, that doesn't always give totally conservative results. You might decide to put a maximum temperature of 800 degrees or 600 degrees as a steady state, or you might put in a predicted temperature curve, what you anticipate will happen. So depending which one, one of these you pick, you go along the top then and say, okay, um, standard tests, experimental tests, um, expert assessment, and then it's have you a single, single unit, have you a multiple <coughs> subframe, have you a full building. When you're moving into full building, you go into experimental curves and you need to predict the curves. You can't have a new standard curves at that stage. So it just gives you some guidance on, on doing that. Okay? Again, things that will tell you is that if you've got a, a large building and you say, okay, the detector will pick it up in three minutes. But in reality, when you look at it and calculate it, these little formulas allow you to calculate, depending on the height of the ceiling, depending on the rate of burning, and how far away the detector is what velocity the smoke will be going past the detection, and what heat will be at. So if you have a heat detector, if, even though it's designed for smoke detectors, it bases everything on heat, okay, on the heat of the smoke. And if there's a relationship between heat and smoke then, between smoke and heat. And so depending on what radius is out, it goes out like a, like a, a stone going into a pond, it'll go out like ripples, and you can calculate the velocity and the temperature at any point in the ceiling, based on the height of the ceiling, and the fire, whatever is burning. So you can, because now the only thing then it shows here's time to detection from distance from the fire. But in reality, you might have certain windows broken, you might have a true draft, you might have different things going on, and this is probably more likely a curve rather than a straight line. Okay? So that's all in the PDs as well. Oops, sorry, I have to go back one, I'll go back one. Now, fire service intervention times. So just, just to think it through. So let's say it might take two minutes for a limerick control to pick up the call, take the details, and push the button to, to send out the fire brigade. If it was Cork City, they'd be there about 20 seconds, I'm sure the chief would tell us, but, but I don't believe him. Right? So then it's roughly six minutes for the county to respond, much, much shorter if you're in the city because they're full time to be fair to them. So in the county, it might be eight minutes before we leave the station, or we may drive five to 20 minutes to get there. <coughs> Excuse me. Once we arrive, which could be between 30 minutes, possibly for the city, I saw 28 minutes, or maybe quicker for the city to be fair to them. Once we arrive, you can't just rush into the fire, you have to look around, look, is there any dangers? What's going on? Do we need additional fire appliances, find water, and so on? So there's a certain kind of setup preparation time. And it's only at that point, which is at least probably 
15, 20 minutes later or 40 minutes later, potentially even, before we decide to do anything. If there's people in the building, we might go straight into search and rescue with a small amount of water, not really tackling the full fire at this stage. So it could be quite a distance on. So it's not a question of further get arrived in 10 minutes to start putting the fire out. A lot of other things have to potentially happen. So you just need to keep that in the back of your mind, just thinking, look, the fire will be able to hear the rescue, everybody, everything will be fine. Okay. <coughs> just, so there's a whole code in that, very interesting stuff. Okay, but just, just there. Now, move on. Again, you can calculate the amount of firefighting water you'll need. So it's all based on this little queue again. So remember, you, we had the queue based on the fire load in the room. That multiplied by the area of your compartment, to a power of two thirds, by a number, and that'll give you the amount of water you need in meters per second, based on the fire load in the room and the compartment size. I'm of a firm belief that compartment is important and more, I like to see smaller compartments if it can be easily done, much easier to fight fires. The majority of papers say that once a fire goes <coughs> over 230 square meters, fully, fully going fire, we really can't do anything with it. Because as we put a lot of water onto it, the water <coughs> atomizes so fast that we can't get to the seat of the fire. So a really large fire, a lot of what we're doing is trying to stop it spreading further rather than putting the fire out in reality. Okay? But there's a way of working that out. There's more formulas that can tell us how many hoses we need. Now, also when you're working out fire water flow, I haven't put it up here, but there's different factors to put on. If we put 50 liters per second onto a fire, there's actually only 50% of that actually getting to the seat of the fire. So you multiply 50% of that. Then you also presume the fire isn't burning perfectly. So you use a 50% value of that. So they balance out. Okay, but there's little, little things you do like that. So, okay, so that's that one. No, so that's kind of the, so a couple of photographs now just of, of fires. <coughs> Since the leisure center in Bellary over years ago, what's just interesting is that um, the fire, you see that the, you see the, the roof is gone. So if it, because it, it, there's so much air getting in and there's so much exhaust getting out, that's almost burning like a bonfire in a field. You know, there's what's called a fuel bed control fire. The only thing making the fire hot is the actual fire load burning on the floor effectively. And once that's burnt out, the fire would, would decay. And that's why some of these plastics, which would probably only self-ignite at maybe 500 degrees centigrade, that's where they haven't all burnt. Parts of them have burnt, other parts haven't. So fire load burnt, and plenty of air getting in. It didn't ever get to a ventilation control fire, which would, when it goes from one type of fire to the other, that's the maximum point of temperature when you're designing. Again, something we're always watching for the fire is the idea of a cylinder blowing, pressurized cylinder, and um, once it gets up, temperature at 550 centigrade, which might be about four times the pressure it was at the beginning. Steel as well enough is getting soft from the heat at 550, it's at half its strength. So you've eight times the normal stress in a fire, even at 500 degrees centigrade. And when it goes higher, that obviously, so that, that's why they can blow. So just to show you that. Structural steel post fire. Again, I'm a bit of an advocate for timbers. I can see other people here tonight who are advocates of timber. Um, structural steel, we regard as non-combustible material. But in reality, we've all designed for thermal expansion of steel, the 12 by 10 minus five or whatever it is when we're doing bridges and buildings and we break our buildings every 50 meters or whatever to, to allow for that. And we're designing for, let's say, 30, 40, 50 degree temperature difference. But if you're designing for a thousand degree temperature difference, you can imagine the, the amount of movement is phenomenal. And at 70, it's around 700 degrees centigrade is 25% of its strength. So it's just going all over this, it's hinges forming in every direction. So steel goes into, you know, in an awful mess. It'll also burst at all your compartment walls. So if you've unprotected steel, or even steel inch mess and coating, and it's protecting a block wall, you might get your 60 minutes, you might get your 90 minutes, <coughs> but after that time, the chance start to move enough to burst out your block work, and you can end up with your compartment wall down on the floor. Okay, timber on the other hand, the core of timber will generally stay cool for a reasonable period. Now it will burn through eventually, it's burning at a standard rate. Larger timbers, Quite often after a fire, they'll, they'll resist full burnout quite often, quite often. From the point of view of doors, quite often people might say to us, look, the doors that you have here, 
and um, these would be fibers now to be fair but you so anybody with lovely oak door 45 millimeters thick they say look isn't that great it's, it's an oak door sure look have that perfect fire door but in reality the actual panels the edges of the panels where they rebate into the frames or into the the whatever the styles whatever you call it, parts of the door main frame of the door that might only be seven or eight millimeters thick so if it burns at two thirds of a millimeter a minute on good hard work maybe half a millimeter a minute very rapidly it burns through the panels and then you left with this situation. In this case, where the, the door held very well, the back of the door, most fire doors are just chipboard in the middle, solid chipboard in the middle is what they are. Chipboard burns at around one millimeter a minute once you get at it. So effectively, if you 45 minutes of chipboard, after 30 minutes you don't have enough of that left. And then once the door was kicked open by a firefighter or whatever like that or opened, it just the, the back of it is gone. So just just I thought they were just interesting photographs to show you particularly about the panels. Okay, so that's so to move on to just to the kind of last section, I suppose, on structural timber, and um, a little bit more on that where, where that is at the moment, particularly from a fire point of view. This is quite an interesting building, E3 building in Berlin. And what's interesting about it is it's a, a glue laminated timber building. And it's got post and beam uh, structure, which I'll, you'll see in the next slide, and it's got glue laminated floors. So when I walked into the building, every single wall, ceiling, is totally untreated, just timber. Which is very unusual, because 99% that more, that nearly every building, would be fully slabbed over, all the timbers are slabbed. They use the structural material, but they're slabbed over. Okay, just like we use steel. Now, the way this building worked is, this building here is flammable to a degree. It's got an internal staircase, with the next external staircase over here, concrete stairs, separated from the main building. So you can escape rapidly and down an external staircase, and that's the design philosophy of the building. Now, that doesn't mean with a small fire, now it's not sprinklered either, which, which I don't prefer to see it sprinklered, but anyway, so that's just a kind of a showcase building, let's say. Now, a post and beam connection in a timber building, generally very heavy members, generally steel plates, with steel dowels through them, kind of connecting them in that manner. You may have bracing members, and that would all be fully slabbed over generally. Okay. Now, just touching composite floors, it's a question that kind of comes up every now and again, where you have your timber deck, uh, timber, in this case, LDL, laminated veneer lumber, which is just like, it's like glue lamb on edge, let's say very thin elements of, of timber glued together. So again, you rely on them glue in a lot of these elements. So glue laminated beams, LVL. You want to be a little bit careful in the fire situation because it mightn't burn exactly the same as solid timber. And you want to make sure as well that the type of glue being used is correct. So just to have a, a look at this for a second, what was quite interesting is that when you look at the connections, if you want a full composite deck action, now in some cases, because timber expands and contracts differently to concrete, Sometimes there's a slip layer put in, and the concrete is only put in there for a sound point of view, just to give a sound mass deadening. And, and all load is taken by the timber floor. So it depends on where you're designing it. Okay? If you're connecting one to the other, glue is, is fantastic. You get a total, if you get a really good bond, you get a very high strength, but then you get a rapid brittle failure. And if it's affected by heat, like epoxy at about 68 degrees centigrade, this thing called glass transition temperature. So some epoxies can fail very, very early. We've done a number of tests in them, but there's also a lift around. So quite brittle, even in a cold situation. Down at the other end, if you dial type fasteners, you can have quite ductile. And what's quite often used is a notch combined with a, with a dowel. And these give good, you know, good ductile and good strength, where these give quite low strength. So that, that's a good combination in here. Just out of interest, okay? Now, um, this is a building finished last year in Vancouver. Sorry, the end of 2017 in Vancouver. An um, 18-story building. I think 17 stories over a concrete single story in glue laminated timber. Okay? Um, so then the CLT cross of timber, just to put people what it is, basically it's like huge sheets of plywood, maybe 200 millimeters thick, in, in total, large panels craned in like that, and um, together with, with with long with, with long kind of connectors connecting it. Now, one thing to watch with this is that when they're laying this up, 
They only glue the main face between the stacks of battens. They don't glue one batten to the next batten. Okay? So why I'm telling you that is that when you look at the bend near in plane, so it's, it's a one-directional element, it's not a two-directional element. <coughs> so what's happening is that the one that's working in plane here is fine, so that in a cold situation that's fine. In the opposite direction, if you're cutting a piece out for stairwells or something like that, because the top ones aren't glued, there's no glue in the joints in the top back, they're only spacers effectively. So you're down to, you know, maybe a third of the beam strength or whatever it is under bending. So you just watch that. And in a fire situation, I have more slides, but I couldn't put them all up there, is that once the bottom layer burns off, you've effectively lost two layers. So if you're doing a glue laminated floor, and you're working your 0.67 millimeters a minute, remember, once you lose a layer, you lose two layers. Do you know what I mean? So that's something you can get caught, maybe, versus solid timber. OK, so timber charring, glue laminated timber, and solid timber, 2 thirds of a millimeter a minute is the standard kind of burn rate. But just because it's hardwood, a lot of hardwoods now are coming in, they're not particularly dense, as you know. That's the same as a softwood. There was an old rule of thumb, one millimeter for softwood, which would be like panels down here, and a half millimeter for hardwood. That's for good old fashioned hardwood, not stuff's coming in now. Most hardwoods are 0.65. You might get, you want a very, very good hardwood to get to 0.5. I would think, now I'm open to, 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 to abuse or whatever. So wood panels in, one and 0.9 is you know, quite a fast burn journey in wood panel. <laughs> One thing to watch in the wood panelling, if quite the majority of wood panelling is maybe 80 millimetres thick or thinner, in which case if it's less than 20 mil, you have to check the euro code for the correct values here, or the or, or ISCN 338 or whatever. So just to know, that's beta zero, so that's what you'd normally use. But as we'll see in the next slide, there's also a beta N. And what the beta N is, it allows for corner rounding. If you have a beam, it's, and it's getting hit from the side and from the underneath, that corner is going to round. Do the way if you throw a log into the fire, a square log into the fire, after a while the corner rounds, doesn't it? So to allow for that, you keep it as a rectangle and you use the bigger value. Easier to calculate. Okay, so we'll see on this side here. So if the gray area was your original timber beam, it chars at two thirds of a millimeter a minute. So in 30 minutes, it's got in roughly 20 millimeters. And we're at that white kind of roundy one. We don't really want a white roundy one. We want a square red one, much easier to do. So we come in the 0.7 millimeters instead of the 0.67 or whatever it is. Okay? Now, then we do what so, so if we were putting thermocouples in the kiln in CIT, we, we, once it gets 300 degrees centigrade, we determine to be charred. But in reality, seven millimeters inside that, that little red band, there's going to be a zero strength layer. There's very little strength. So you take seven millimeters off on top of that. The research that's just been done last year shows that that seven millimeters is quite variable. It's seven millimeters in the euro code, and that's what you can use. Obviously, look, the euro code is, is, is correct. However, it can vary between about two millimeters and significantly more than seven millimeters, just, just out of interest, okay? So that's the, that fella. Now, on board protection, if we have a timber beam, it's charging at 0.67 millimeters a minute, and 0.65 and away you go. And if it's you know, 30 minutes off, it's going to burn that much and so on. Now, let's say you put a plasterwood slab around it to give it 30 minutes protection. Here's your 30 minute slab. It stays out for 30 minutes, then it falls off. And once the slab falls off, the timber behind it is preheated, so it'll burn much faster until the char builds up. So it'll go up like this. And then, when about 25 millimeters of charge build up, it'll start to go back to burning at the normal rate. So now the difference between this beam and this beam is maybe only half what it is here. So you've only gained 15 minutes as against 30 minutes of your protection. Do you know what I mean? That's just simplistically done, but you can see where I'm coming from, hopefully. Now, temperature temperature profiles. So the, the, the kind of mid-blue in the middle <laughs> is 300 degrees down. So at 30 minutes, this is a 100 millimeter wide 
my 20 millimeter deep beam, so no, normal enough beam, at 30 minutes, in the middle here, it's 44 degrees centigrade. So, it, so if that was in a kiln, it would be about 838 degrees on the outside, yeah, 841, but 841 on the outside, the kiln itself, and if this, is, this is a charlie around here, but it's still 44 in the middle. It's a very good insulator timber. That's why you retain the strength very well if, 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 if the fire will put itself out or, or be put out. At 60 minutes, again, it's up to 945 externally, which would be round about the ISO 8834 curve. And it's 78 in the very middle, and you, you, you've arranged a small piece of timber left, and it's 300 at the edge. So just to give you an idea about the installation values of timber. This was something that we did in Edinburgh in 2016. What we did was we said, okay, let's look at the different compartments, how much timber lines are in the different compartments. These are only small little units the size of the electron container. It, it, it has cubes. So the first one, they just put a timber ceiling on. And they put, they put kind of uh, accelerators and various fuels in here to roughly mimic what kind of fire need to be in the compartment. Now it has quite a large opening, so it should burn reasonably well. Um, it was kind of calculated. So in this case here, fire went out. They then said, okay, let's put one piece of timber in the top and one in the back. Fire went out itself. Then we, we did a third one here. We put um, on the back, on the top, and two sides. Fire went out. Then we made a fully timber box. We had to put the fire out. Kept burning. So it's all to do with the ratio of timber face and opening and fire load. But it does show for a lot of configurations, the fire will go out itself. There wasn't thinking a number of years ago for a period of time that fuel laminated buildings will self extinguish. To a point they will, okay, but, but you, need, you need to watch all your openings and watch your fire loads and various things. So that was a very, very interesting test. Now, some more work that was done then showed another thing from the negative side, okay? There's, here's your standard, this light blue line is your standard ISO fire curve for carbon material. This is a slow burning curve. Sometimes you might have a situation, if you have a smoldering situation, slow to burn, but what might happen if you have heat detection in the room, it might pick up the actual, you might realize it's a fire. So it might be a long time before the fire gets called, and all of a sudden then, when it's picked up, it will shoot up the other curve very quickly. So it can have different effects. Uh, and also your, your different um, smoke retardant treatments at doors and things might activate because they might get hot enough. Um, this thing is just your, your bonfire and field effect at 650 degree one. This is a hydrocarbon curve. This is, let's say, if petrol is burning or diesel is burning. Now, if you start in certain cases where you fully expose timber, it's been shown to follow this curve because the, the timber is actually putting energy back into the room. Okay, so you need to be quite careful with fully exposed timber. So it's quite a good idea at the moment where we're, we're, we're lining all timber and that's probably good. Okay, but, but it, it's fairly new, we're still working our way through it, let's say. Now, we're coming near the end, you'll be glad to hear. Okay, so just look at non combustible construction. If we've concrete, we regard that as non combustible construction. <coughs> this is a CIT kiln, we put in, let's say, um, a reinforced uh, element into it, into the kiln. We brought it up temperature. We thermocouples throughout the element. The kiln went up to maybe, I don't know, 800 centigrade. And interesting enough, when the center core of the concrete got up to exactly 100 degrees centigrade, boiling point, the whole thing basically exploded inside the kiln. Much to everybody's upset, but anyway, we'll have to put a cage on it the next time. They will get us. But it's just quite interesting, right? Likewise, if you test in the lab, once the temperature gets hot enough and the steel gives and spoiling happens, you'll actually get, get column failure. So it won't always stand up. Steel we've touched on already, HUS and coating and various things like that, and you know, it will, it lasts a period of time, it will potentially fail. Then looking at timber from a positive point of view, um, this is a 90 minute timber wall, CLT, Three layers of 12 and a half millimeter Fermacell, and Fermacell say that'll give you 90 minutes, which is up to a very tall building potentially. Now, on the last slide, uh, at one of our cost action meetings recently, um, 
with people from Canada. And Canada has shown now that if they put three sheets of Fireland board or Fermacell or Trim Hapman board on the ceiling, even with some small gaps in it for exposed timber, if they have two sheets of Trim Hapman and Fireland on the walls, they can go to full burnout. So in other words, they can have a building on fire, they can go to full burnout, fire will go out, and, and the building will still stand, the timber won't be damaged. So the Swiss, with the Andrew Frangie, who's part of the group I'm involved in as well, who's one of the one of the leaders, I suppose, and he's involved in the same committee, all these, these are part of committees. Now, what the Swiss are now doing, they're adding slab protected cross laminated timber to a list of non combustible elements of structure. So they're saying, look, this is better than fire protected steel, which I'm kind of in agreement with, you know. So on that note, oh, we're almost there. I have to throw an ad up for CIT <laughs> before I finish it. <laughs> Why not, as I say, as I have the floor. Um, now, at the moment, I think we have a number of modules, single modules in CIT that we run, kind of Friday night to Saturday morning over four weekends, or else online over 13 weeks with an exam at the end. We've done building regulatory engineering, we've done fire safety certification and fire safety engineering. Now, both those two modules are half prescriptive and half the PD7974 stuff for top the calculation stuff. Do you know what I mean? I see a few faces here that have had the pleasure of doing it. Um, but I find them very interesting myself, and I, I think a lot of people find them interesting as well. It kind of brings you to the next level a bit. So you can, you know, rather than just do prescriptive, you can, you can kind of ramp, ramp it up a bit, get a good understanding of what's going on. We're going to add to that first stage of design probably next autumn, which would be, you know, port frame collapse design, sprinkler design, smoke atria, smoke control design, that kind of stuff, you know. Then we do a fire testing module to get a better understanding of all the different tests and codes, testing codes, and a project. And we hope to link those together to do a special purpose award for engineering practice, and which will be a level eight, a level eight award. So just to, to let people know that that's there. The other three modules at the moment uh, that are running at the moment. The online one is about 30 applications in for the moment. We only take maybe, I don't know, 16 or 18 or 20 or whatever. So that's, this, these are coming to be full as well. There might be a place to left of them. Um, this, is, this one is online, and um, this one is in, in classroom in February, and this is online. That's starting the uh, Wednesday, the 30th of January, Wednesday, Thursday, 31st. Just down the picture, so I just pop them up there. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and it might stand for another 10, 20 minutes. If you've uh, engineered Joyce floor, the chances are at 61 minutes, if you look at any of the fire tests, it's on the floor. Catastrophic collapse, so very different. Um, if you want to be really right with the solid timber for Joyce floor, you can actually batten it, let's say, where you're putting the where you're putting the duct along, and actually put another slab above it. So you box round and then put the other slab underneath. So you'll fall a for, for, form a false floor over the duct. Perfect situation. Other thing is to put on the caps, the, you know, the caps in it. Um, certainly, you have to put on the caps if it's going to be an engineer joist. Has to be done, you know. But there's more coming up from the department. More department are actively working there at the moment. Does have any help? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> is Andrew exhausted? Is yeah. Yes. A timid man at the back there. <laughs> Okay. No, no, I, I was, you say, you say it's incorrect, is it? Yeah. Absolutely, and it gives you 60 minutes. What I'm saying is that at 61, it's there for 60 minutes, and we, there's no issue with it. Don't get me wrong. If it gets 61 minutes, we tick the box prescriptively. But I'm just saying, from our own point of view, tests we've done in it, even even core low tests, we were quite disappointed in it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, this metal into your joints web. No, it gets 60 minutes, and we'll accept it. Absolutely, don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, at 61 minutes, some of the tests show that it's on the floor. Sorry? Well, absolutely, you comply. But I'm just telling people that if you go and read the test behind it, you know, often it actually collapses catastrophically. It just makes it and then collapses because it's on its knees. Whereas timber joists, you've additional safety factor, even for bracing other elements and everything else. Well, but these, these were both uninstated floors I'm comparing. Okay. The, the, the first floors in buildings. Okay. Like, I don't know, you, everybody's come from different angles, you know what I mean? Don't get me wrong, once you get 60 minutes, man, you'll get your fire set, there's no issue. Do you know what I mean? I'm just saying, look at the tests, just information for people, so that there is differences, you know? Okay. I didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yes. Well, but that's just for that's just for Gibson now. To be fair, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, absolutely. I, I, I say I don't even know to try and cover a lot of stuff, and I, I just throw a couple of things just to get some. Uh, absolutely, Sean's quite right. Obviously, you need to you know, look at the catalogs. That's just for Gypsum, Gip Rock Pipe Book. Do you know, there's the fires, there's thermal cells, depending on what you're using. I just give, yeah, exactly. Good point, you know. Good point, Sean. Yes, right. <coughs> Um, I suppose the report that came out was, was a bit disappointed from the timber point of view, but rather than saying that the lining should be not combustible, it suggests the whole external wall should be not combustible. I just wonder if that would be too far too fast. I think it's, it's a pity, even what I've shown there, that if timber can survive total burnout, it's properly the lining details. You know, is it a bit unfair to make the whole wall be non combustible? It might be, you know what I mean? It's all about detailing the lining, non combustible lining externally. How can far get at it? The way the flashes were, like we did some testing here in CIT, and we put, um, we put a metal flashing underneath the window, let's say, which was with its combustible insulation, and then no flashing, and then plasterboard slab. And we found one with the metal flashing got hotter 
the law without it. Because it directed heat into it, which is very interesting, you know. But if you're not robust to be a firm cell or whatever kind of around it, protecting those key locations, you might be able to stop the fire from getting into it initially. And maybe have more cavity barriers that can only go up floor, hit a cavity barrier with the spread into the full system. You know, but I think not combustible is, is, is probably good, but I think it should just be the lining or the, the external element, not the full wall, I, I would suggest, you know. But the outside the ship has a little bit, so rolling points from the front. Yeah, yeah. Rolling points, really. Yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah. Yeah, no rolling points, it would be the best collapse design, really. That had to, had to happen, that, that was death, you know. That was death, so you, you need some contingency in any building, you know. But I think my view all the time is, and it's been a few years, that look, you get your building to work, make sense, and then look at the code. You know what I mean? Rather than trying to find all these loops and go around in circles, and you don't get a sense of the building, you know? Okay, and if there are any other questions, we might kind of draw the evening to an end. Uh, just before we finish, I'd just like to, to comment that I think in the space of an hour, Andrew took us through quite a lot in terms of legislation, Give a bit of background. Uh, I think the site problems he highlighted would probably be of interest to most people. The fire safety design, well, I certainly learned a little bit about PD7974. And then I think he finished with what is obviously something of great interest to himself. I think he's picked that up, his interest in structural timber and how it reacts to fire. So on that note, I'd like you to put your hands together and... Uh, <laughs>